uh, Romans 12, 2 says that, you know, our bodies are a living sacrifice, devoted to God. Um, that's our reasonable service to Him. We belong to a different kingdom. So that's why we're the same. I'm not saying you're American and you're not Albanian, really. We belong to the kingdom of God. We are Christians. That's our real citizenship. We are part of the kingdom of heaven. So we need to think that way first, right? Not what does the world say, not just what does my culture say, what do the women around me say, what does feminism teach? We say, no, what does the kingdom of God, how does that prescribe and describe my role, right? Everything about us should reflect that real citizenship. Because when we look back, like, pretend that this, this space here is, is eternity in heaven, and here this little dot right there, that's our time on earth. That's our time here in Albania or America or wherever, wherever we live, right? When we look from the, the spectrum of eternity, from the perspective of eternity, it won't be that big of a deal whether we were in Albania or Romania or whatever that, or Albanian or American or whatever that meant. It will be, this is the real kingdom. So we want to order our lives here and now as a bride in that kingdom, in that marriage, uh, with Christ, right? And when we're there, that will be all that matters. Did we take our time in this step, or a time on earth, for God's glory? Did we live to show him off and show how great he is? So, number two, you're not born for the purpose of getting and keeping a God. That is not our, our God-given mission in life, right? And I, know, I don't know about you guys, but some American girls, that seems to be all that matters. Um, they have a wedding all planned out, and... It's really important to them. But singleness in Christ's service is complete and good. Um, so, you know, so many, I, on my phone, I have a picture of um, a girl who worked in our office, actually, and she just sent me a picture. She just got married while we were away. And uh, she has, um, she ha I'm going to show you this because it's unbelievable. Look at all the little girls. This is not her bridesmaid. She had one bridesmaid for each girl. So she had that many bridesmaids and that many flower girls. These are her flower girls. So <laughs> and she had this plan the day after her engagement. So we're like, Ashley, you've been thinking about this wedding way too much and way too long. <laughs> she had no problem coming up with 12 bridesmaids and 12 flower girls. Wait a minute. That is not what we live to dream about, a wedding day, right? Our real wedding day, that is all. And now in a few years, she'll look back and she'll say, you know, it really wasn't all that important. I mean, it's fine. It's not a big deal. But the real wedding day is the one when we meet Christ. So, you know, do you get upset when a guy doesn't call or talk with you? Or do you get upset if the wrong guy doesn't try to date you? Um, it's because we've adopted the wrong mission. Every situation is an opportunity to glorify God. So think about guys that way. The way that I interact with guys is it going to be about God's glory. Okay? Uh, number three. God, God wants women, all of us, it's not about marriage or being a wife, to learn and live by his plan. So what is he calling us, all of us, as women, to live like? What does it look like to be a uh, biblical female? Uh, feminine, femininity that... Um, falls under the kingdom of God. Uh, complementarianism is a word, have you heard this word? It is the view that there is equality of men and women with different roles. So complementarian says that we are equal ontologically in personhood, but we have different, um, we complement each other in the way that we choose to live out our roles, in both marriage and in the church particularly. The Bible describes very clear ways that we would order our lives. So it is rooted in a literal interpretation of the creation account and the roles of men and women as presented in scripture. Egalitarianism is the view that at all times and in all ways, men and women are always equal. So the Bible is very clear about a complementary view, as we will see. Um, God created woman for man, it says in John 1 Corinthians 11. Uh, Jesus made it clear, though, that not everyone will marry, right? And Paul, too, did talk about that that's good. So we still need to think about, whether married or not, you know, what does it look like for me to be the kind of woman God wants me to be? Um, we are the ones who choose the follower position in the marriage and in the church. Complementarian does not rule out women in the work world, 
but it is the Bible's clear teaching that in the church and in the home that there are uh, that we want to order our lives in the way God wants us to. Uh, okay, let's move on to point number B. So how do we arrive at a universal biblical principle that American and Albanian and everywhere else regarding feminine feelings? So we begin by answering these three questions. What does what did it look like before um, sin came into the world in pre-fall perfection? Secondly, are there any um, commands, clear commands in the Bible that we are to follow? And thirdly, what does God look like? What does, uh, how does God show us, because uh, we are to reflect him, we're made in his image. So what does he look like and how can we uh, think about being a woman made in his image, okay? So those are the th three questions we're going to answer. First of all, did God say anything regarding men and women during the time of pre-fall perfection? Genesis 1 and 2 is all we have, right? Just a small little part of our Bibles, right? Did God set any pre-fall ordinances in place that we have skewed because of sin and the way that it helps us to think, right? Um, if we look at Genesis 2, 15 and 17, God told who to take and keep the garden in? Who was given the command? Adam. Adam, right? We know that. So he was given by God the role of leader. And the one responsible throughout scripture is Adam. If we look at Romans, if we look at what happened with Abram and Sarah, right? Sarah's the one who said, no, go sleep with Hagar and have Ishmael. And who does God have blame her? No. In Second Peter, uh, in First Peter 3, she is lauded for the way that she um, treated Abraham, Abraham, right? So we see that the man is always held responsible. So we need to understand that, that in God's eyes, in a marriage and in, and in the church, the man is given the role of leader. Um, in Genesis 2.18, what's the role of Eve? What's the role that she's given? Exactly, as the helper. It's a complementary role. Uh, both Old Testament and New Te Testament narratives and examples you know, reinforce this. If you think about Sarah, and even if you think about Deborah in Judges 4 and 5, She's a beautiful example of someone who fulfilled her helper role, right? Barak was afraid. He didn't want to go and lead. He was really afraid. And she said, no, you need to go and be that leader. And he's like, no, I can't go by myself. Okay, I'll help you, right? And she went with him. And then in Judges 5, not only she could have sung a song and said, oh, they didn't really want to lead. I had to go help them. No, she said, I applaud the leaders. I'm a mother in this land, and I applaud the leaders who went forward in their fear and end. And then when we turn to Hebrews in the New Testament, and Barak is mentioned, is it Deborah or Barak who's mentioned in the faith chapter? Barak is the one who's mentioned. He is upheld as a, for the faith that he showed. So trying to see the heart of God and think how God would think about this versus how the effect of sin on our lives helps us to think about it naturally. It's really interesting. Um, in Genesis 22, 24, and 25, there's another really good thing set in there before um, sin comes. We see that um, the men, the husband and the wife, were naked and unashamed. But we also see in Genesis 2, 24, that they, they left the father and mother. There's the leaving and cleaving that took place. Now, were any children in the Garden of Eden? No. So the principle of the priority of the marriage relationship over the mother and child relationship is seen right there in pre-fall perfection. Okay, so that's uh, answering the first question. Did God say anything about it before sin came in? Yes! We don't have much, but he did say something about our roles as many women. Secondly, are there any direct scriptural commands by which God reinforced this way that he thinks, this heart that he has, this ordinances that he put in place? Um, in the Old Testament, if you look at Numbers in Numbers, you see Mosaic law, and men are commanded to be the leaders of the homes, right? A, a woman's word didn't mean anything if a man in authority over her refuted it. She could say it, but if it was if a guy said something different, it didn't mean anything. In the New Testament, we have Jesus coming to fulfill the law and establishing a new covenant. Now it's not just so much those words we say and those things we do and whose word stands, but it's our hearts that he addresses. He says, go deeper. Make it your mind to be like Christ, right? Don't just um, not have adultery with a woman. Don't even, if you think about it, like you've already committed adultery, right? So Jesus takes it to our hearts. What's going on in our hearts? Do we have a heart to want to be women who follow after God's heart, right? Um, we are commanded to edify the body of Christ. 
um, including submission to church leadership and to be respectful and submissive and obedient to husbands. Um, men are commanded to lead and both are commanded to prioritize the marriage relationship. So all throughout scripture, God consistently follows through on the heart that he has expressed in Genesis 1 and 2. Um, thirdly, the third question is what about the character of God, the image of God, right? How can we glorify him by reflecting his unchanging character? God will give us, never give us, never, God will never give us principles that are in contradiction to his character. I'm, there's a big typo right there. You mean, okay, never. God will not give us principles. Sorry about that. So does the character of God reveal anything about roles? So when you think about God, I, I wish we had a whiteboard here, but um, let's pretend this one here. So remember, have you seen this triangle? where God is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they are all equally God. And yet, the Father sent the Son, and the Son came as a submissive servant to the Father, right? In John 5, we read that Jesus, the Son, said and did everything the Father told him to say and do, right? So we have this picture of the Son submitting and coming all the way to the cross in obedience to who? To the Father. So the Father is the architect of the plan, and the son is the submissive servant, right? If you read Isaiah 53, you see that servant language used for, for Christ. And uh, what about the Holy Spirit? What does the Holy Spirit do? Does he have a plan? No. Well, who's on earth right now? The Holy Spirit, right? Living in us, empowering us, and comforting us, and counseling us, and illuminating the word of God to us. We wouldn't have the power to do anything for kingdom value apart from the Holy Spirit. So he is the one. So you see, Christ is not no, no longer here. He is ascended into heaven, seated at the right hand of the throne of God, right? So you have these, you have this equality of personhood, just like complementarianism, and yet different roles that they don't cross. They, they, they hold to their own roles. So when we embrace complementarianism, that we men and women are equally created and of equal value in God's eyes and equally sinners needing his grace, right? Equally heirs of the gift of life. And yet we have different roles that we choose and order our lives by. We are imitating God. We're showing a gospel picture of, of to the world by how we choose to order our lives. And ladies, it is becoming a bigger and bigger statement than ever. I don't know about here, but in America we have such gender confusion going on. We have Little kids say, oh, I was made a girl, but I want to be a boy. We have bathrooms in, in the schools that if a, if a guy decides he wants to be a girl one day, he can go in the girl's bathroom. There is such confusion and such, it is a blurring of the lines that we started, I think, by our rebellion to God's, what God said in his word about roles. So when we teach our little girls and our granddaughters, it is a wonderful thing to be a woman. And it is a wonderful thing to want to be a follower, to want to be in a responsive role rather than a leadership role. That's a great thing to want to serve. Then we are helping them to see that gender uh, distinctiveness and the way that God has created us as men and women is a good thing. And that is becoming a, um, a completely antithetical to the way the world thinks, right? Because the world thinks, oh, just neutrality. Does, does that make sense? So, we, so this, what we're, what we're understanding here, what we're learning about, is really important for the next generations to come. And we Christians are going to look more and more different from the world as we embrace what God has said about being men and being women. Okay? And we get to teach the girls, this is a great thing, it's a really good thing. Okay? Now, how does God's plan affect my life? So what are some of the ways that I am going to um, uh, order my life? So feminine females, uh, we're going to look at three things about us as women, feminine females. So we embrace helping and submission with a gentle spirit. Do you think that it is weak and wimpy to be a submitter? If you do, then you think Christ was weak and wimpy, right? Because he submitted all the way to the cross. No, that took amazing strength. What he did for us on that cross, that he submitted all the way, that's incredible. It is not a position of weakness in any way, shape, or form. It is a position of surrendered, controlled strength. And control takes strength at all times. So we've been talking about...
about complementarianism and our role as women. And we've been talking about three questions. Anybody remember what they are? What's the first one? If you want to make a universal principle for complementarianism, what are the three questions you have to ask? Life before sin is the first one, right? It's the second one. Are there any direct commands that God gave about it? Very good. And what's the third one? Remember the triangle. So what's the third one? Created in the image of God. Yes. So we're, we look at the God. Because nothing that God ever calls us to do is going to be different from Him. We are always going to want to look at like Him. We're made in His image. So we ask, how do we reflect His image? So now we're looking at some practical ways that we embrace helping and submissiveness with a gentle spirit. Um, and we talked about how submissiveness is not weak, it is not being a doormat, it is being strong and surrendered self-controlled strength. So first of all, in Romans 16, we have that great example of, um, what's her name, Phoebe? I just, yeah, it's in Romans 16. Yeah, she, so, God, so uh, Paul commands Phoebe, who is a servant of the church, to welcome her in the Lord. So we understand that all of us, right, we are servants of the church, and that's a really beautiful skill that we can think about. How can we be helpful to that end? Secondly, we grow our skill in submissiveness by obedience to parents in the Lord, right? Um, there's a great philosopher, I don't know if you've heard of him, his name is Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> And Winnie the Pooh says, wherever you go, there you are. <laughs> so, you'll have the same attitude toward a husband someday as you had toward your dad. That's really true. If you have a disrespectful attitude toward your father, if you are constantly critical of him, you are going to find yourself doing the exact same thing when you get married. Because wherever you go, there you are. It's really true. It is not about our circumstances. It's not so much about the other person. It's about my heart embracing Christ-likeness and wanting to be respectful of authority. So um, grow in that skill. You will be no more submissive to a husband than you are to your father or others in authority over you. Your pastor is a great example, right? The way you think with respect and submission about your pastor. The test comes every time they tell us something to do something we don't want to do. It's a test. What's my attitude? Uh, thirdly, in order to glorify God, you must also choose submissiveness to pastors. And there is a typo here as well. Well, Hebrews 13 is correct. Uh, that's where it talks about that we would have um, make their job a joy for them. Uh, to employers in Colossians 3 and to governing authorities in um, Romans 13, 1 to 7. Remember that submission is never disobedience to God. As um, Peter said, we are to obey God rather than man. So as long as we have authority that is helping us to live according to God's word, then we submit to that, right? Okay. And if, it, if we're ever asked to do something that is against the Lord, then we do not submit to that. So the first one is helpful submissiveness. And the second one is that we embrace a quiet spirit. Now this is something that we all need to really work on. What is a quiet spirit? Does it mean that I zip my mouth and never say anything? Not at all. It means that I can calm my heart. I can wait on God. I know how to trust in God. I don't make a catastrophe out of every single so every situation is a problem for me. I determine, as a matter of fact, not to catastrophize a situation. I, can, I control my heart so that it learns how to wait on God. And all of us have to do this because we have a little thing called hormones, right? And they cause us to want to make catastrophes on certain days, right? Was a problem on last Tuesday? This Tuesday is a huge issue when it's just like got me on the edge of my seat and I'm going crazy at it, right? But I work hard to become to have a quiet spirit so that I know how to control what's going on in my heart, right? I don't catastrophize situations.
situations. I am aware of negative, toxic thoughts, and I control them and bring them around to Philippians 4 8. What's true, what's noble, what's excellent, what's praiseworthy. I don't let my mind dwell on the things that are toxic and that turn situations into worry. Another little phrase that I completely take out of my thought life is this one What if? Right? You know what ifs? Because God is in control of everything. So I can always rest in His sovereign goodness and control over every single situation. So in a, embracing a quiet spirit, we find out what is needful for us, and we become a hard worker in making disciples, of helping other women to think this way, right? Calming worry down. We become wise by learning Proverbs 31. Now, do you understand how Proverbs 31 was set up, right? In Proverbs 31, you have um, uh, Lemuel's mother. Uh, sorry, is that the name? Yeah, yeah. Brains. Right, the words of King Lemuel, his mother is teaching him these things, what's important for you. And at the end, he gives her a beautiful, amazing poem about, so here's the kind of wife you need to look for. And a lot of times we hear people belittling Proverbs 31, 10, 31, but no, let's think about it well. There are six things going on there, basically, and they're foundational. The first one is foundational. The first one says, this woman, she fears God. So that's the foundation on which we build our lives. We fear God. Secondly, the way the passage is written, it teaches us that we are loyal to others. And a guy looks at us, and he says, okay, she is loyal. She is someone who can be depended on. She will not cut the pastor down. She does not speak negatively of her boss, right? She's a person who can be trusted to do good to others. Um, the third thing she does, and this gets the most verses in the passage, she works hard, right? She rises up early in the morning. She is industrious. She learns skills. She understands things. She does her best in, uh, in school, right, in education. This is what a guy is watching for, is supposed to be watching for, right? She's hardworking. Um, fourthly, she is characterized by generosity and kind speech. In the Bible, it uses the language of open hands. So she has open hands to do good to the needy and to give, right? And also she opens her mouth and is kindness. So, you know, really work on a really great way we can do this is by helping with the kids in church. When we teach, speak kindly to them. And they, if we're doing child care or something and our patience is tested and we, and we open our mouth with kindness, you know, test ourselves in these things that we can grow and learn. Um, next of all, in the pyramid of, of Proverbs 31, she's characterized by optimism. She's cheerful. She looks, she's not afraid of the future, right? She's prepared. So she, um, she's eager about the future. Worry is lazy. Thinking, what if this, what if that, and worrying and being anxious? That's a lazy person. But a spiritually hardworking person can look with optimism and good cheer toward the future. Because she does what she can to get ready for it. I do my work today, and whatever else, I entrust it to God in prayer, right? So there's, oh, there's, that's the work of being characterized by optimism. Do I speak joyfully? Do you speak joyfully? Do you laugh well, right? Um, this is the most attractive, I think, of all the levels of character quality that this woman displays. So we need to be the women who know how to laugh and bring joy into our room. And finally, she utilizes her God-given creativity for financial gain. She, we are entrepreneurial, right? We um, think creatively and do things with our time and make things or work hard and um, think, uh, figure out what you're good at and enjoy it and market it well, right? Good job. So this woman's life proves she could live under the income of a husband and be a financial assistant. It's not a hindrance to him. So point number three, how do the above manifest a quiet spirit? Because you don't do them for yourself, right? You do them for the good of others. And that's the main point of the Proverbs 31 passage. He is looked on in the gates by the elders as well because of the way he has chosen. See, life isn't about us. Life is about God's glory. So we need to be willing to make our lives be about helping and serving others that they will do better. And that's what a wife does. She's in the helpful position of her husband being looked at and respected in the gates. Right? That's the main verse of that chapter. 
uh, verse uh, 23. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. So your goal is to become a woman who could bring respect to the man she marries, which honors God's plan and brings him glory. It's not about you. You do it quietly. You don't talk about it. But that's the way we order our hearts and our lives. Fourthly, it's not a bad idea to take the quiet word literally and speak more quietly than men. But what it's talking about is quietness in our spirit. So we don't create a catastrophe of situations. We aren't about our own life. We are busy working on the levels of growth for the glory of God. A really important sentence here is that we won't be frustrated by desires that aren't met. Okay? We won't let our minds think about, oh, I really, really want something. Like, I really, really want maybe marriage. Or I really, really want children. Or I really, really want, for me, it was grandchildren. I need to, um, I don't let that be frustrating to me. Right? Because I will quietly work hard at growing in the fear of God in service to others. Okay? Denying myself. But considering others more important as Philippians teaches us. Now this third point is following is a list of ways not being a feminine female wrecks relationships with masculine males. Um, so the first way is if we are demanding. And we have those desired base lists. I made a list. This is what the guy I'm looking for has to look like. It's not a, an awful thing, but I really heard a really I heard a really good list by a Bible teacher named Liz Curtis Higgs. Has anyone heard of her, Liz Curtis Higgs? Yeah. She she has written a lot of fiction, and she also has some really good Bible studies out there. Now, Liz Curtis Higgs is a big woman. She's probably um she, she's a really big woman. I. I don't want to guess how much she weighs, but uh, she's one of the bigger women that I've ever seen. Okay? She's a fantastic Bible teacher. She is really good. She's really funny. She knows her Bible like inside and out. She's a really good Bible teacher. And she gave us this list of three things she looked for in God. She didn't get married until she was in her late 30s. And she, she spent her life studying the Bible and teaching women the Bible. Okay? She said, this was my list. I needed to find, if I was going to get married, it had to be a guy who knew the Bible better than me. She knows the Bible. Okay? He had to know the Bible better than me or love the Bible better than me. He had to love God most, more than anything else. And third, he had to love me just the way I am. Exactly the way I am. Remember. Okay? Most American guys struggle with that. All right, so... The Lord brought her a guy who's a Hebrew professor, <laughs> right? So he knows the Bible in the you know, Old Testament Hebrew. <laughs> Two, he loves God most. And three, he loves her just the way she is. And they have a bunch of kids. And so, see, God's faithful. And that's a good list, right? I like, I like that list. Does he know and love the Bible better than I do? Does he love God most? And does he love me just the way I am? So that's, I think that's a great list. Um, the guy that, if we're looking for a guy, he has to be one, because he's in the follower position, right? So he has to be a guy that I will decide to be under his lead. He has to be a guy that I will decide to follow. It's not so much about what a great leader he is, but it's about whether I will decide to fall under his leadership. Um, so when we have a demanding desire based list, he has to be this great leader or whatever, uh, we make it hard for him to do his job because we have critical thinking. We have negative thinking. That's our mindset. We want to be women who are gracious. A great example for this is Esther. Do you love the book of Esther? Right? We love Esther. We are so drawn to her, the princess, right? But just think about her. She started out as one of like the 200, hundreds of the most beautiful women in the land. And she stood out above those women to the eunuch. But they're all the most beautiful, they're all the beauty pageant winners, so it wasn't surely that she was so astounding and more beautiful. Why did she stand out to the eunuch who was taking care of her, of them all? The Bible said, if you look at the direct translation, it says she lifted up grace to his face. There was a graciousness about her that stood up above the other women. And now these women were going to spend the rest of their lives together. 
the, all the ones that didn't get chosen as queen would not have their own families, would not have their own marriages. They were all going to be in a harem together for the rest of their lives, right? So in that setting, knowing that that was what, where she would be living for the rest of her life, she was able to have a gracious spirit. She wasn't worried, right? She was gracious. And that's what stood out to being a, And then the inter other interesting thing about her is that when she was going before the king and she was able to have whatever she wanted, she didn't make a big list and say, I have to go to Loxitana, I have to, you know, she didn't say, I need all these things. She said to the eunuch, what should I bring? So she wasn't demanding, right? She was wise and careful. So we learn a lot from Esther. Uh, let's see, incessant talk is a problem for us, isn't it? Right? If we meet a guy and we give him this constant flow, I have to tell you everything about me, you have to know all these things about me, right? Uh, that's just selfishness. It's just more, you should know more about me, how cute I am and how wonderful I am. Don't give away every little thing about who you are and want, or you wanted to think you are. The job of a husband is to understand his wife. So give him some things to ask questions about, right? Keep him wondering a little. The guy who wonders whether he wants to spend the rest of his life understanding you will wisely run from a girl who just speaks every single thought that she has. Um, next of all, a problem number three, a problem for us is if we are fake. We don't want to hide and cover up, but we want to be open and confessing our sin. And that's what we always teach. Look for someone who's willing to confess sin. Look for someone who's a forgiver, right? That's a person who lives in the power of the cross, right? That's a person who knows the gospel of Jesus Christ and brings it into conversations. So be open to confess my sin. You know, please, I was really negative and worried there. Please forgive me. Um, prove who you are and watch who he is. Don't listen to words from him. Just watch, because it will be your job to submit to and respect that man if you marry him, right? If you are trying to control how he treats you, then you get a fake relationship going, right? And you don't get a good dynamic for what it's going to really be like. Um, and if he's any kind of leader and you're trying to control everything, he won't want to be near you anyway. So spend your dating days watching to see if this is the guy you'd like to have making every major decision for you for the next 60 years. And whether you will be willing to fall under those decisions. Um, a fourth problem that we have that we bring into relationships is if we chase the guy, if we take away his leadership role. He's the chaser, he's the hunter, he's the pursuer in his God given job. So if you call a guy, we have girls, we do this teaching, and girls say, Well, can I call a guy? We just had that happen in Romania. And um, don't, no, you don't call a guy. Let him call you, right? If you if you call him, if you pursue him, get used to it. Because you're going to be, five years down the road, you're going to be saying all he ever does is sit there. He never leaves. So don't pay the expenses of a date. Paying is part of the male leadership role. Um, another problem is when we plan everything, right? We try to control everything. Set the tone of how your time looks together. Encourage, you just encourage passivity and weakness if that's what you do. A guy with any guts will hate being smothered and will withdraw from you. So mama's boys who are looking for a mother like a controlling female. You don't want to marry a mama's boy? Don't try to control him. Right? Rather wait and see what he wants. But still, remember to be fun. To be creative, to bring ideas, to have fun. But let's say you plan an idea for two days. Oh, I have this great idea. Let's, we'll do this together. And then you express it to him and he says, no, what do you do? Do you upset? No, you say, wait a minute, he's the lead, so okay, let me try and figure out if I can have another idea that he will like. Okay? And then the final problem. Oh, you know what? Just to say about and plan everything, one more thing. Um, one of the things that I found that I do in our relationship together is when we go to a restaurant and we get to a table, I just stand there and wait. Because Bob will inevitably decide where to sit and tell me where to sit. It's just a small little way that I uh, have of backing away and letting him take the lead. I need to learn more ways. I, in no way, shape, or form, have this down. I'm constantly walking in confession and repentance. But if you want a practical little way, it's when there's a, a restaurant or being chosen, just say, okay, you choose. Or, uh, um, where everybody's going to sit at the table, just stand there and wait and see if he takes the food and chooses where everybody's going to sit.
a good leader who does it. So, but I have to back away. Um, the final thing here is that is a problem is if we have sex, right? If we reward with our bodies, if we don't bar the gate, he will come back for more and more, but he will tire of you and eventually find someone else. You've taken away what he's chasing for, as we learned last class, right? And worse, it degraded God's glory, because the purity that we bring to a marriage is about the glory of God. Now, please remember this. And I've worked with many, many girls who are abused as children. Many, many girls have given their bodies to a guy who then left them high and dry. In God's eyes, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In God's eyes, if you were raped or sexually abused, that is not impurity on your part in any way, shape, or form. In God's eyes, you are pure. So you need to think about yourself the way God sees you, right? When we confess our sins, we are cleansed of all unrighteousness. Don't think about the way you see yourself. Think about the way God sees you. And He sees you as a pure, spotless bride that He will come and marry. Okay? And you and I will be feasting at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And He is our Lamb. That's our reality. That's the most important thing we have to remember. At the cross, we are cleansed. He sees us white and pure. So please remember that we all need that gospel every day. We all need that beautiful forgiveness. We confess our sin and we walk in Christ's forgiveness. And that's what it means to believe. That's what it means to believe the gospel. That we are cleansed and forgiven. Right? That's His grace that empowers us to go up pure, cleansed, right? Covered by His blood. That's what God sees when we are saved. He sees he sees the perfection of Christ, right? Not us, right? And what we do in all of us. He sees the beauty of covered by the sacrificial blood of God. All right? I don't know how we are time-wise, but we I think that's perfect, don't you think? Yeah. Shall we pray together? Let's just pray together. Father, open our hearts to what you've given us in your word. You're beautiful and glorious. You are about glory. You are about joy. Thank you that you are that kind of God. Help us to think about being women who reflect to you, who show a watching world your gospel. Help us to um, live in your joy and your cleansing and in your light and to walk as those who have no burdens because you have taken our burdens on yourself on the cross. Um, whatever the hardships and difficulties, are in this room that are represented here. We thank you for your power and your cleansing, for your precious, precious blood, for how you give us um, good courage and how you give us grace to stand and to breathe and to walk and to show off Jesus to a watching world. Help us to be those women, we pray. And Lord, I pray for any of the women here who are thinking about a relationship, that you would give them wisdom, that you would give them um, grace, that you would help them to just cry out to you on their own before you, and that you, you know that you give wisdom for everything that we uh, ask for beyond what we could imagine. Help us to rejoice and take the next right